If I was running Domino's, I would open up that platform, somewhat like an AWS. But if Domino's suddenly said, hey, anyone can join our platform, Vice wouldn't exist. And when you look at the big chains combined, they're not actually that big. But the reality is they're very powerful. They're very powerful because they work together. You have the big chain on the right side doing close to a million dollars a year in sales. And you've got the independent on the left side trailing way behind. We all shift to third party aggregators in order to compete. And these guys charge anywhere from 20 to 35%. Slice's original name was MyPizza.com, and that was a bootstrap business. Domino's and Pizza Hut and Papa John's are no longer advertising phone numbers. This move to digital was starting to become a real thing. Black or white, you either operate as a Domino's or you just go alone. And three out of four people had chosen the independent path. I mean, it's there, but it takes a lot of hard work to get to that level, and the job is to step and repeat that scale. Lear Sello, welcome to Change Order. Thank you so much, Jason. Thanks for having me. Excited to have you. Yeah. Uh, question to start, Macedonia. Yeah. What's, what's up with Macedonia as a country? Where is it? Why yeah. is it important to you guys as a business? Uh, it is now called the uh, North Macedonia. Mm. Uh, as a result of a dispute and settlement with Greece, uh, I brought that up because it is right north of Greece. Uh, it's north of Greece, um, east of Albania, and west of Bulgaria. So it's tucked in there. It was the southernmost republic of Yugoslavia, hmm. former Yugoslavia. Um, I am Albanian by background. I was born what was then Yugoslavia. Uh, today it's Macedonia, right on the border of a uh, border town with Albania. And um, yeah, I have a lot of family members there. Spent a lot of time there. It's a beautiful part of the world. Uh, so it's actually very appealing to go there as well. Um, and so when I started slice and I bootstrapped, I realized that opportunities there um, did not exist, but talent was incredible. And so uh, unlocking opportunity for that talent allowed allowed us to really scale nicely. It's amazing. You guys have an office there today? We have three different offices in three different parts of the country. Three different parts of the country. Wow. How many employees are over there? Uh, about 600. And is that something that you started when you started Slice, or did that actually start with your first business before? Uh, it started with Slice. Well, Slice's original name was MyPizza.com, mm -hmm. uh, and that was a bootstrap business, bootstrap for five years, and um, originally started hiring data entry folks there to build menus for shops, uh, the pizza shops that we work with, uh, because it was just a very tedious process. And then realized that there was an opportunity to hire just incredible talent. So when we needed customer service, hired customer service folks. When we needed sales, hired sales folks. And have just more or less grown grown from there. But it started around 2010, I want to say. That's incredible. And, and just for my own knowledge, and I think everybody else, because offshoring is something that we're big believers in, especially in the SMB segment. How do you think about the difference in wages like between the U.S. market, Eastern Europe, and you know maybe why you guys chose Macedonia versus Latin America or the Philippines? Yeah, it's a good question. I, uh, I did not start the process off that way where I'm assessing wages, and it wasn't like some well-thought-out um, approach. It was really um, a result of me having just deep knowledge of the, of the area, of the region, because I was born there and I lived there until I was 10 and my family still, a lot of family members are still there. And so for me, it was really more about giving them opportunity. Mm. Um, you know, in my family, uh, like many other immigrant families, um, especially from typically third world countries, like my dad worked his whole life, especially uh, at once we moved to New York. And much of that uh, process then ends with uh, him sending money to his family members in Macedonia. So you send money to family there to support them because opportunities there are very limited. Um, and as my brothers and I got older and it became our responsibility to also make sure we're, I mean, they're doing well, but making sure we're supporting them so that they don't uh, fall, um, fall backwards. But I realized that, wait, uh, I think this idea of just like sending money is kind of, mm, uh, I don't know that it creates the best habits for people who are on the receiving side of that. Uh, so I felt like uh, earning money would be a much better um, setup. And so I initially just wanted to create some opportunities for family members. 
um, in terms of wages and all that stuff, I kind of have the local knowledge. I know what the what the barriers are, or what the benchmarks are. And uh, one thing I didn't want to do was um, have anyone there feel like um, I was going there to take advantage of of the lower wages. So I understood what the average wages were, and I doubled that. Mm. Um, so working at Slice at that time, or my pizza, um, everyone knew that you can earn a lot of money. Wow. Um, and everyone knew that the opportunity was to work for an American company. And um, it created this incredible inbound funnel of talent to the point where there's actually a person at Slice who is a surgeon, a medical surgeon, who quit that job and joined Slice to work in IT, basically, um, because they were earning more than what they were as a surgeon. Um, that's amazing. So that's how that started. Um, but yeah, it wasn't like, this whole like assessment process. So if I go to North Macedonia tomorrow and I bring up Slice, is everybody going to know about it? Yeah. I mean, everyone will know about it. Yeah. That's super cool. So you kind of take a step back. Your family was in the pizza business before. I think they had a shop called Charlie's Pizza. That's right. Give me a story. Like what was it like growing up in a family with a pizza shop and how did that kind of inspire you to get into what you're doing today? Yeah. I was actually not born yet when they owned that shop. Uh, so my grandfather, my uncle, my dad, just our families, they owned a shop called Charlie's Pizza in the 70s uh, on 75th and 3rd here in New York City. My older brother was born right around uh, right around that shop, and he was born in New York. Uh, and then my family moved back to Macedonia, or what was then Yugoslavia. Uh, my twin brother and I were born, and we grew up there, and then in the 90s, we moved back. When we moved back, uh, both of my uncles had gone back into the pizza business. So my dad's brother owned a pizza shop called John Anthony's in Brooklyn. Mm. My mom's brothers owned a pizza shop called Patty's Pizza in uh, Long Island. And a lot of family and friends own pizza shops. Albanians um, have kind of gotten into the restaurant industry, especially in New York. You know, as some people succeeded in the space, other people decided to get into it. But there's also this phenomenon where um, some pizzeria operators that are very successful have helped their family members shops in order to create opportunity, in order to enable uh, family and friends to also have an opportunity to succeed and control their own destiny and all that stuff. And so growing up in that world, um, I mean, the lessons are it's uh, one of the most difficult things, um, you know, anyone can undertake, especially running a, a, a shop where you're the owner operator and you're taking on all these responsibilities. It is brutal in terms of number of hours that are required. Um, Charlie's Pizza was open until 5 a.m. It was only closed between 5 a.m. and wow. and I think 9 a.m. But it was open otherwise um, the entire day. Um, and most of these uh, operators are typically strong uh, around making food and serving customers. So like they understand the craft, but they they do not understand cash flow. They don't understand marketing. They don't understand uh, accounting. So they inherit all of these problems uh, that I don't know many folks who go into the business appreciate uh, the magnitude of those challenges. Um, and so it, it typically ends up being this like very reactive running around like crazy type of uh, type of operation, but can be very rewarding for those who know how to how to manage it. So were your family members sharing recipes between the different restaurants? it's it's a it's a it's a very much a copy paste business for the most part now there are some unique creators makers that dabble into the craft and like launch very uh authentic and like um innovative products around pizza mm -hmm. but for the most part most pizza shops um are basically a copy paste of the one prior um most people that i know when they opened up a pizza shop they took the menu from another shop and maybe they scratched off a couple of the items that they don't want to make, changed some prices, changed the logo, and then now they have a pizza shop. So I've said this for a long time, the, the independent pizza community is like one big chain. They just don't know it. They don't, they don't operate like that. But it is very much a copy-paste, not in a bad way, um, uh, experience. Is it true that uh, Ruby Rosa is basically a spinoff of Joe and Pat's? Well, it's the same family. Yeah, so there you go. It's Ruby Rosa, Joe and Pat's, Ciro's, which is an incredible shop on Staten Island. And there's a Pier 76 uh, pizza shop also on Staten Island 
they're all the brothers and sisters, siblings that um, ultimately branched out into into more products. So if you have a Ruby Rosa product, I'm sure they've probably uh, dabbled with the recipe a little bit more, but for the most part, it's it's the identical product. That's why when I want to try pie, I don't, and I don't want to wait in line Soho. I walk up to these village, you know. Yeah, you go to Joe and Pat's, and you'll you'll have Ruby Rosa quality and basically identical product. Yep. That's amazing. So you were talking to me earlier about how your twin brother has his own company, you know, building out offices. And I know that Slice and before that My Pizza was not your first startup. You had another company before. What was it about your environment growing up that inspired this entrepreneurial spirit? Um, it's a good question. I, I when we, I remember this vividly. When we moved to, to New York, we landed in JFK. I, I come from a town that has no traffic. I've told this story before, but uh, I'll say it again. The town I came from, it's less than 10,000 people in some place called Macedonia. There's no traffic lights. It's a tiny town with almost no opportunities. And at 10 years old, when you're landing in JFK and you're looking out the window of the airplane, you're like, where am I? Like this place look like, it looks like magic. And my dad is very entrepreneurial and he's always, um, uh, I would say, embedded this idea in, in my, myself, my brothers, um, of the opportunities that exist here. Like anything is possible. And they sacrificed a lot to move back to, to the US. Um, mm -hmm. they, they really did it for, for us, for us to, to gain an education and gain access to these opportunities. And so just from that young age and having this um, um, almost responsibility to make sure that we maximize the opportunities um, uh, and, and go after that entrepreneurial sort of path because that is the differentiating factor between what's possible here and most places around the world um, was probably the, the main driver. Was he instilling that by telling you or was he just showing you with his actions uh both so my my dad um at a young age he was a pizza shop uh, sort of operator but eventually he became a master tailor uh so he's actually one of the at his at the peak in the 90s was one of the well-known tailors on the on the planet mm. um just a side story he made the the wedding suit for john f kennedy jr no way yeah uh, and there's a whole story about that on if you search it but um, so he, he worked for Tommy Hilfiger, uh, at the, you know, what they call the blue division where they make suits. Then he worked for Banana Republic for outerwear, but then he just branched out and opened up his own shop. Uh, and, and that was on 20th and 5th, uh, which is ironic because our first office was on 21st and 5th. So it's just like across the street. And, um, yeah, he worked, uh, long hours. He would come home. He had another small part at, at our home where he had a, a, a shop where he continued working until 12, one o'clock at night. And he would just do that year after year. Uh, so both showing and, uh, and I think just instilling those ideas. That's so cool. I, I remember growing up, my dad would like leave for the office at 5 AM and he would come back at 4 PM to like coach our sports teams. He spent a few months a year over in, in China and he would always tell us too, like, you can go do whatever you want to go do, whatever's going to make you happy. Like that's what he really wanted. But by, setting the bar and setting the standard like of what he was doing and sacrificing, I feel like I just observed it and was like, okay, that's what I need to do with my life. Absolutely. And um, I mean, one thing my dad would always say is that the rules of this country are skewed towards entrepreneurship. They are set up in a way that um, I don't want to say forces, but like um, incentivizes people to open up a business. Um, whether it's a small business or, you know, like I, I didn't grow up or I didn't launch my first company thinking I'm launching a startup. I didn't launch slice thinking I'd launch the startup. I just launched the business that hopefully can provide value and, um, and ultimately, uh, you know, earn a lot as a result. So speaking of adding value, your company before slice was nerd force. Mm -hmm. Some might say you were Ryan Dennehy before Ryan Dennehy, you know, an electric. I tell him that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, how the heck did you come up with that idea? Uh, there was a company called Nerds On Site in Canada um, that I thought was just brilliant in the way that they were operating because I had a lot of uh, friends that in school. This was the emergence of broadband internet, early 2000s, um, and just like PCs and laptops and networking became a real thing. 
Um, and so every small business and home office needed help with all of these things as consumers went from offline to digital, uh, not business, but just consumers as well. And um, a lot of my friends were IT, IT people, like computer repair people. They would go and reformat computers and update uh, memory cards, like all these like basic um, tasks, but most people don't know how to do those. In fact, even today, probably most people don't. And um, what I loved about Nerds On Site was that it basically um, converted all these common, um, let's call it independent uh, computer repair people into a network mm. uh, to unlock brand and then unlock some um, shared services. And I was like, well, that's genius. And I need to probably do something similar here in the US. And so um, I just, I was like, hey, let me come up with some nerd names and ended up with Nerdforce. And that was the domain that was available, nerdforce.com. And um, yeah, I was the first, you know, uh, IT person. And then a bunch of my friends were like, let's, let's jump in. And we divided zip codes. So we hired uh, three or four people to answer the phone. We got one common number. Uh, I still remember it, 1-800-979-NERD, um, which is 6373. And so the phone line went to a central location. We had a couple of people who were booking appointments. We had Blackberries where emailed appointments would show up. And then no one had to worry about booking appointments anymore. We could worry about fixing computers and setting up networks and maximizing our time. Then we created a knowledge base because not everyone knows everything. So we created a knowledge base so that Whenever anyone came to a dead end in terms of some solution, we emailed and it, the email went to all of the texts. Hmm. Somebody would have the answer and they would respond back and you would finish your job. Or you can call each other. Um, we, we bought some products in bulk. And this thing just started to like pick up. And by 2005, this is 2003, by 2005, I think we had 40 or 50 technicians on, on the you know, in the ecosystem, and they were all independent contractors. Yeah, just using the the Nerdforce uh, Nerdforce brand. The Daily News featured us on the centerfold uh, in 2006 of companies that were thriving five years after 9/11 mm. uh, in New York City, and we were one of the five. We were the the company chosen that was based on Staten Island, and that created just a massive inbound um, number of calls, people wanting to buy a Nerdforce franchise. Uh, and so I was like, I have no idea what that means. I have no idea what a franchise does, but um, ended up uh, researching it and spoke to a couple of lawyers. One of them wanted to charge uh, $100,000 to franchise the business. I didn't, I didn't have that money, um, but I was really convinced that we needed to become a franchise. And so I locked myself in the office for like uh, a long weekend and I learned how to franchise the business and I just kind of got it all done, done myself and but it started off by basically realizing that if we all work together and just uh, divide up the different zip codes in terms of area of responsibility, um, that we could be stronger as a network rather than an individual. How big did you scale that business? Uh, we ended up scaling to 124 franchisees. Uh, and I sold it to a public company out of the UK. We ended up launching managed services and hosting and all these things all the way through 2009. The company in Canada that you studied, how did you learn about it? Um, one person on Staten Island um, started driving around in a red Beetle. By the way, people associate Geek Squad with Beetles, and that was Best Buy's uh, brand that they launched in 05, I, I believe. But this company had that idea super early on, and, and so some technician on Staten Island decided to become a nerds on site network uh, technician. But they're a Canadian company, and I met them, and I was like, hey, what, what is this about? Do you get real help? And he's like, no, not really, and they're in Canada, and I'm out here. Um, and so that was uh, the first time I came across it. It was just this, like, red car riding, riding around the, the, the city. And did you start diving into public filings, or, or how did you kind of unpack the business and figure out how you wanted to make it better and bring it to the U.S.? Oh, no. Uh, no, no, no. I was, it was, <laughs> I was 23 years old. I was just like, uh, this sounds like a great idea. Um, all my friends are already doing this. We're all doing this. Um, why not launch the, that version here? And, uh, I didn't really 
pay too much attention in terms of what services they were offering their independent contractors. But it was clear to me that the most annoying parts of my day-to-day were as I'm trying to fix a computer, I'm getting a call for an appointment mm-hmm. for the next appointment. Um, as I run out of products, I, I was going to Best Buy to, to buy them, uh, you know, Linksys routers and things like that. So just solving the problems I was, I was facing uh, myself. And as we grew and kind of came together as a, as a team, trying to solve more and more of those common like shared problems was just the focus. And what made you want to sell? Um, in June of 2008, um, there's a brilliant uh, uh, entrepreneur and leader um, who had launched a one of these prepaid cards where you can buy next generation electronics, almost like a, an e-com version of Best Buy. And they wanted to layer on services to that experience. So if you bought a computer or TV or whatever through this platform, then you get a nerd force, um, you know, membership. Yeah. And then that would boost franchise opportunities. So mm-hmm. that would boost the franchise funnel because more people would want to want to buy in. And that was a very, I thought, brilliant um, strategy. And so in June of 2008, I sold it to a public company and decided to, to be the leader of the nerd force division. Um, it was a very fortunate moment in time because I did earn some money from that sale. Most of the sale was in equity in this public company. But by November of 2008, the world changed. Um, small business um, lending just completely dried up, which is the um, driver of franchising. You, you have to get a small business loan to buy a franchise because it's capital intensive initially. And so it just, I mean, I think I sold at the perfect time, uh, but I didn't know it at that time. Now, the equity side of my uh, sale also went to basically zero. So I didn't really realize the earnings, but I think the business would have struggled regardless. Hmm. And so the first business that you started kind of was a, a spinoff of another idea that you had seen. And then you came up with the idea for my pizza, which then became slice. Yeah. Uh, I remember seeing the announcement for the slice financing, uh, by Ben Sun primary when I was not at primary and I was like a what a pizza <laughs> app like yeah. why did you decide to focus on just the pizza market and how is that even possible for a venture scale outcome yeah um I started what was then called my pizza uh, because a lot of family members because of the nerd force part of the business that own pizza shops wanted help with online so they wanted websites eventually started hearing a lot of um uh, chatter about online ordering systems, uh, Domino's and Pizza Hut and Papa John's are no longer advertising phone numbers. This move to digital was starting to become a real thing. And, um, you know, I was like, okay, let me, let me learn a little bit more about this problem because it's just so common and it's so frequent in terms of, uh, these pizza shop owners who kept asking for help. And I took, I want to say, you know, up to a year to really study what was going on industry wide. Uh, so in this case, I learned my lesson. And I was like, okay, let me let me study. Um, I, I know everything about the four walls, inside the four walls of a shop. I know the economics through and through, and we can talk about that. But I wasn't really fully aware of what was happening broadly. So what I learned was, uh, and by the way, I had just come come out of a franchise model. Uh, so we were the franchisor. I was like, okay, that I that was my MBA in franchising. I know everything about it. And so... I'm like, okay, we've got this franchise model. That's one way for people to own a business. And now I have all these family members that have these independent businesses, hmm. but they're at a disadvantage. I know that because any market we opened a North Force location, ABC Computer Repair was at a disadvantage. Uh, they just could not compete because of our economies of scale. And so I would ask family members, why don't you just open up a Papa John's location? And then you realize that they want to open up authentic brands. They have authentic products. Um, and so when I looked at the overall industry, I realized that um, the franchise option had one fatal flaw, which is takes away the creative freedom of the operator. It's black or white. You, you either operate as a Domino's or you just go alone. And three out of four people had uh, chosen the uh, independent path, basically going at it alone. And um, the other thing I learned was Domino's was at that time constantly talking about online orders. 
order online, order online, order on the app. And uh, when I looked at the data, it was clear that online orders were worth much more to them, both in terms of higher average order values and greater uh, efficiency. It costs less to serve that customer. And they can communicate with those customers in at any point. And so uh, Domino's at that time was 15% digital, 1.5. Today they're 80. 80% 80 of their orders are digital. Mm. Um, and at that time, independents were basically zero digital. Uh, today they're probably closer to 15% where Domino's was 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Still a gap to fill. Huge gap. And so... Um, so that was one. Two, they all had these common shared problems, but no shared services. Uh, so I realized that there was an opportunity to build uh, what I would call a third way of operating. And that was that is a reverse franchise model. So I've called it that from like day one. And so you've got the franchise model. You've got the independent model completely alone. And now you have a reverse franchise model, which is the benefits of the franchise. But the... Um, without the commoditization or, or strictness of the model. You can operate in the gray. Um, you can adjust to the local needs of the market. You can bring your brand forward. And so that's, um, that's how I came up with. And I, I realized that that brand and that capability would be um, ideally just pizza.com. Couldn't buy that domain. Um, apps were still not really a big deal then. So I ended up buying my pizza.com and that was the, that was the brand. Hmm. Do you think that founders, when they're starting new companies, should be studying other businesses in the market more? Oh, yeah. Um, my favorite thing has always been to read, like, you know, um, whether it's stories about companies' success or um, stories about founders, stories about great entrepreneurs. Because every business, I, I want to say 80 to 90% is identical. Uh, especially a successful business. And then it's the last mile that is nuanced and different. But I definitely think people should, without a doubt, study different business models. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, history repeats itself. It just like has a different flavor yeah. a bit. Mm -hmm. And it feels like with Domino's, for instance, like if I invested in the Domino's IPO, I would have made over six or seven X what I would have made if I put the money into Google's IPO. And so clearly they were doing something right. The question then becomes, can you replicate what they've done and productize it for small business owners? And it feels like that's what you've done incredibly well. Yeah. Uh, I, I say this often, by the way, I should have hedged, not hedged, but I should have parallel pathed a uh, slice with an investment in Domino's. Um, that would I, been, I that want would to check what fifty k, what a fifty k investment in Domino's in twenty ten would uh, would be worth today. But maybe that's homework for after. Um, when I talk about a lot of the products and services that Slice brings forward to the market, um, it may sound um, now some of it is probably very innovative, but for the most part, it may sound like it's all innovative. But it really is just a platform and an ecosystem that has already been solved in one part of the world, but it just doesn't exist for this group of operators. And I also know that Domino's would like, if I was running Domino's, I would open up that platform, like somewhat like a AWS, mm. or if I was Starbucks, I would open up their mobile platform and make it available, but they can't because they're locked into franchise agreements and they can't create competition for their franchisees. And so they're, they're stuck. So, but if Domino suddenly said, hey, anyone can join our platform, uh, Slice wouldn't exist. There wouldn't be a need for it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very much a, an extension of that franchise ecosystem and products and services just made available to a group that has no access to it. Did you ever consider broadening the scope and just going after DoorDash? Uh, no. Um, DoorDash is a partner, by the way. Uh, DoorDash launched um, in 2013, I think. I, I didn't know much about it, and I didn't really follow too much um, of the VC and VC-backed companies. I actually didn't really know what venture capitalists were until uh, I met Ben, basically, um, and that was in 2015. Um, I was just building a business. Um, you know, we it was costing us about a dollar per order to manage that experience, and we were charging two dollars per order, and that's it. With like 
create something for a dollar, sell it for two, do that as many times as possible. Uh, and so we bootstrapped. Um, I didn't really hear about DoorDash until I want to say 2016, 2017. Um, but our, my focus has always been vertical integration, uh, asset light, vertical integration to independent shops to build the next generation chain just made up of SMBs uh, and help them succeed, basically increase the success rate of, of independence. There's a lot of conversation around horizontal platforms in different sectors versus vertical. So DoorDash versus Slice, for mm -hmm. instance. What advantages does a vertical focus give you guys? Well, e each one of those decisions comes with advantages and disadvantages. Um, th there's no right or wrong choice. I say this to our team because I think we've fallen into this trap uh, from time to time. And sometimes that that window has been a year plus, And it's I consider those lost years. Um, when you go vertical, there's a set of choices you're making about what you have to do and what success looks like uh, and what you should not do. One of the worst things that, I've, that I see is when horizontal players behave like verticals or verticals behave like horizontals. Um, mm. When you're a vertical player, our job is to basically, for lack of a better term, monopolize this category. Like we have to have a significant, we have to manage a significant part of the GOV, GMV, of each shop. If we're uh, just a tiny fraction of their business, but we're limiting ourselves to only pizza shops, we're basically DoorDash for pizza or mm -hmm. Grubhub for pizza. And that's a failed strategy. And so I think when you go vertical, what you're choosing is to expand the TAM through multiple products and services um, and, to, and to really get deep into the, into the experience and the relationship with the customer. When you go horizontal, it's more of a traditional SMB play where you're, and by the way, when you go vertical, you also can't afford to like burn leads. Um, you also can't afford to churn even at the best rates, best SMB rates possible. Mm -hmm. Like if a churn for a vertical player is 1% a month and, and people are like, yeah, that's great for SMBs. 1% a month is world-class, not for a vertical player because you don't have 50 million or 10 million potential customers. In our case, we have 50,000 potential customers. I can't afford 1% churn a month. I'll run out of shops like in a year. Yeah. And so um, I think the advantage is um, being the dominant sort of force and, and enabler and value creator for multiple aspects of the business for one specific category, category or industry. Um, the disadvantage is if you try to behave like most SMB players in our in our case. Um, so you can't like we can't have four hundred inside sellers calling pizza shops. Like we would burn leads. Mm. You can't learn. Um, you can't learn how to how to solve their problems by trial and error. Uh, there's not enough room for error. Mm -hmm. So you have to like really train ourselves amongst each other and like have a very high bar for who talks to the, to the customer. So there are some like differences with how you treat these relationships versus horizontal. If we were horizontal, I would probably have a five to 10 X greater sales team. Mm. And it would be a high volume, high velocity boiler room style, like sales process. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's how big is your sales team? Uh, our inside team is about 30 people and then we have, uh, so we're scaling it. Probably it'll be closer to 20 or 30 people of, of an outside team. And how do you build a culture around sharing knowledge? So the people that are jumping on the phone, aren't burning through those leads. This is a newer sort of muscle for us. Um, fortunate to, to have, um, hired a, a brilliant, uh, CRO Lauren Paddleford who built Shopify plus, um, hmm. uh, launched Shopify Plus and then scaled it to 10,000 plus brands. And Shopify Plus is the enterprise arm of Shopify that eventually became, you know, the, the revenue engine. It's the moneymaker. Yeah. And, um, and he has just such amazing sort of diverse experience, but also he's a first principles thinker. And, and, and um, so a lot of this is relatively new in the last, uh, let's call it a few months where he came in and he's like, Elir, you have 
a business focused on SMBs, but you have an enterprise business. Uh, each SMB is like an enterprise. You have to treat it like an enterprise. Churn has to look like enterprise churn, uh, not SMB churn. Um, and training has to be done rigor rigorously internally uh, before you put somebody out there. And so uh, what we've done is just created these motions internally where uh, we have sessions amongst our territory managers. We have sessions amongst our inside sellers. Uh, sometimes they're all in the same room. They're pitching each other. They're pitching the manager. Then they graduate from that. Um, so it's a work in progress, but it has definitely flipped to be internal facing. Uh, and then we open it up to, with some friendlies. There's a cohort of pizza shops that are just incredible. These owners are partners to the business. Um, I like to believe we've made a huge impact on theirs, which is which is the reason why. And so they also help us think through best way to position um, our, our value prop. I want to unpack that a little more. So you mentioned that each pizza shop is basically an enterprise and you mentioned that you're vertically integrating which my assumption would be that means you're generating more average revenue per shop than a traditional vertical SaaS player would right is that right that's right if i were to unpack your business and go side by side which i know doordash is a partner but if we were to take a doordash or an uber eats and we were to say okay how much revenue is slice doing per shop and then how much revenue would Uber Eats be doing per shop? What's like the difference from a scale perspective and, and a gross profit per shop? Uh, I don't know the numbers from Uber Eats or DoorDash. Um, I will say uh, for the most part, slices and, and pizza shops sort of uh, distribution in terms of locations is predominantly sm small, uh, small town and suburban. So over 90% of the shops on our platform are outside of dense urban markets. And so these are markets where, for the most part, uh, even today, 80% of their volume is phone-based. Hmm. Um, almost all of the volume is still offline. 15% is digital, as I mentioned. So, so when we think about um, average revenue per shop, first thing I think about is, what is the average uh, number of sales we can generate for the shop or hmm. manage for the shop? And what is the number of uh, supplies we can sell to the shop? Because it's both sides. There's GOV on the consumer side, GOV on the supply side. Um, and what is the potential? How far have we come with a cohort of shops that are really vertically integrated? And there are shops on the platform where we generate north of a million dollars in GOV per year or GMV. Wow. And that's significant because the average uh, revenue per location for an independent is about $600,000 a year. Hmm. So these are shops where we've fundamentally just like change their life, change their business. And most of that volume is managed by Slice. So they don't have to hire more people other than making sure they're making the food and, and serving customers. And so for those locations, we're generating close to $100,000 a year hmm. in revenue Wow. Uh, with margins of 65 to 70%. So, I mean, it's there, but, but it takes a lot, of, uh, a lot of hard work to get to that level uh, and the job is to step and repeat that scale across all locations. And what's the breakdown between consumer orders then in that case and right. the B2B stuff? Well, for, for those shops where I'm, where I'm saying, hey, it's a million plus in GOV, those are all uh, sales to, from the consumer side. So those are sales coming through an omni-channel experience, mm. websites, app. Um, and on the supply side, this is a very early part of our business. We have about a thousand locations that are buying things like pizza boxes from us, uh, that business in total still is at around $5 million in in revenue or GOV. Wow. When you're ramping that piece of the business up, is that changing your perspective on how much you can spend on customer acquisition and the tactics to go out and acquire new shops? Um, yeah, of, I mean, of course, you have to be thoughtful about uh, cost of acquiring a shop. Um, we're fortunate because we have a bit of an unfair advantage in this industry because we've been around for so long and we've created um, significant value where uh, 30 to 40 percent of the relationships come inbound mm. uh, and then we have this amazing team in Macedonia at a very low cost and so our uh, even today even with the deep relationships we're able to create our payback period is still uh, 12 months or, or less in in most cases wow what role do you think AI is going to play in SMB tech in the future I mean, I can speak to what I think it'll 
do for us. Uh, we've always been a managed model. That's what a franchise model is. It's managed. Um, you know, a Domino's location doesn't have to worry about advertising. Domino's location doesn't have to worry about any systems or processes or they're just operating the store and um, serving customers. And so we've taken a similar position where we run and execute the marketing campaigns for every shop. Uh, we handle customer calls when they have a problem. Um, we provide insights and best practices to shops about their business based on benchmarks with lookalike shops. Hmm. And all of this today is done pretty manually by us. This is why we have a team of 600 people in Macedonia. Uh, for us, AI will enable that to become very efficient and probably automate most of it. Um, but in our industry, for example, with SMBs, uh, especially pizza shops, these are, these are very dynamic businesses uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Every single day, something about that business changes fundamentally. Mm -hmm. They either run out of some items, uh, people don't show up uh, because, you know, part-time labor, that's the nature of it. Um, maybe a storm happens, they have to close early. Maybe um, an emergency happened, the owner has to leave. There's so many different nuances to the business. So um, what we have to do is make sure that the the digital presence of the store, the storefront online, the same way that the storefront in the, you know, you know in the physical world, has to, they have to match. They have to always be in sync. Well, today, in order for that to happen, the owner has to open up the owner's app and they have to go and make all these changes. They either have to change their schedule, change prices, 86 items, like omit them from the menu for the rest of the day. And typically they'll call our partner success manager. And then that person at Slice is going to do all these changes. Um, well, uh, I would say it's probably right now very easy for us to just put in some co-pilot type of service mm. where an owner says, Hey, uh, tonight I'm only going to be open till eight o'clock. I just ran out of spaghetti. So please take that off the menu for the rest of the day. And uh, do me a favor, just change the price of a large pizza to $22 and let this co-pilot be like, Hey, I think that's a little too high. Uh, my recommendation is to maybe change it to 20, not 22 done. No one has to go and touch any of this stuff. It's done in real time. It's, uh, it's almost like an assistant. Um, that's the most basic example. Uh, I would say, how do you answer the phone? That is the lifeblood of these businesses. And how many of the phone calls are static questions like, do you deliver to my address? Um, AI is basically going to make it super easy for everyone to be a managed service uh, is the best way I can put it. Um, and so I think the managed service companies should also be very thoughtful about how quickly they automate the human aspect of their, of their model. feels like trust is what is the most important thing then there, right? It's like building trust early and then you can get into the AI and more parts of the business for them, which creates more value and ideally higher retention. Without a doubt. Um, by the way, I don't think owners are like, yeah, I, I want AI, like, uh, especially small business owners. They don't, they don't even don't need to like know that. it's AI. No. <laughs> Uh, they don't need to know. Um, and they don't want technology. They want jobs done. They want help. So they're alone uh, and they need help. And so you have to communicate how you're helping them. And then hopefully these new breakthrough technologies can help enable that. So if you were talking to an entrepreneur who wanted to start an AI SaaS company going after SMBs, what is the value proposition that you feel like is the most powerful? Is it growing top line revenue or is it giving them time back in their day to day? How do you think about that? Um, it's a great question because earlier in my, in my career, I would spend a lot of time um, agonizing over that question. What is the value prop? And what's pretty clear now is that value props for SMBs, for SMB markets, you cannot have one value prop. Uh, now you can, but then you would have to segment your market. So for us, for example, if our value prop was revenue growth, then all of the high revenue shops like Joe's Pizza and John's of Bleecker would not be customers. Because if I went to John's of Bleecker and said, I'm going to grow your sales, they would be like, I'm already drowning. I don't need more sales. Mm -hmm. I need help on this other side. So, so single value prop um, businesses or products in the SMB world have to think deeply about segmentation, even within the category or the industry they're trying to play in. 
Or if you want to solve for the industry, and in our case, it's I'm not even talking about restaurants. I'm talking about pizza shops. There's three or four different segments. Um, we call them, you know, um, like startups, basically early start, uh, mm -hmm. early stage pizza shops that need a lot of volume. We then there's the established cohort, which is kind of they need, need a mix of both sales growth, but also some efficiency. They're more established, but they still need help. And then you have these like anchor shops that. If you call them and say, hey, I'm going to bring you orders, you lose them. So that's the long-winded answer. Um, it's probably multiple value props based on the multiple segments in the category. Or if you're going to pick one value prop, then understand the segments and go after one of those. Mm -hmm. What have you learned trying to get into the supplies business? Um, our, our job is to increase the success rate of shops because 60% of newly formed pizza shops fail in year one, the independent shops. It's very different for franchise models. Their success rate is much greater. And in order to uh, enable that, you have to both increase revenue, but also reduce cost. And going back to the, um, to the different segments, uh, if I went to a John's of Bleecker and said, I'll go and increase sales, they're going to say, I don't need that. But they definitely need to reduce cost. They can definitely use more mm. efficiency. And so we decided to go in the um, supply side of the business so that we can have a much greater uh, impact on a segment of our customers or potential customers. Uh, that was one. Two, um, the online uh, software services aspect of, of a lot of businesses and, and value prop has a long lead time. So when shops partner with Slice as an online ordering customer, it takes a lot, uh, uh, not a lot of time, but it takes some time for that product to build in value as consumers use it more and more. Hmm. But like, I don't plug it in today and then tomorrow they have 10,000 in sales. It doesn't work like that. Like if you plug in an online ordering product to a pizza shop, tomorrow they'll have $38 in sales. Yep. And then, you know, Month one, maybe they'll have 400 bucks out of a possible $30,000 or $50,000, whatever the number is. And that's not, that's not very valuable. Now, if they are patient and they wait it out, eventually it will be. Um, whereas supplies is instant value every single time we show up. Supplies is also an opportunity for us to show up. Mm. Uh, it is very hard for us to get an owner on the phone when we try to sell them software. But with supplies, you're invited every single week because hmm. the owner, you need to go and drop off the product. And so um, imagine getting invited to a customer every single week uh, without having to call them and telling them, hey, I, I want to show up. They're waiting for you. They're anticipating. And when you go there, you can talk to them about the other parts of our, of our um, product set or they will share very honest feedback about where they may have issues so you can anticipate potential churn. Um, but the, the biggest reason again is being able to serve a segment of customers that we would not otherwise have the right to serve and providing instant value, uh, that is not very typical with software. I think the key there is time to value, depending on who your persona is, is critical. Totally. And it's so different depending on the persona. And so you have to identify what is the product that you're going to offer them and how quickly will it bring the value? Otherwise you're likely going to have churn. That's right. And I would say the last reason we did it, well, not the last, these are not in order, but um, one of the things that small businesses lack and they will forever lack are it's, it's buying power. They're alone. And so they're always holding the bag. Uh, even when you look at uh, companies like DoorDash or, or Uber Eats, Chipotle doesn't pay mm -hmm. much for volume, um, but the SMB pays 30% because they have no negotiating power. They have no leverage. They're one, one location. They also have no storage in our case for supplies. Hmm. So even if I wanted to buy in bulk, where am I going to put it? My, my shop is a thousand square feet. I can't buy enough boxes to serve customers for the balance of the week. I actually have to go to home, uh, to restaurant Depot multiple times because I don't have anywhere to put these. Hmm. Um, or I have to order, you know, from us foods and those are expensive deliveries. And so, one of the things I've, I've instilled, hopefully, across our teams is 
everything that we do should unlock economies of scale. How can we bring buying power and network level insights that are just impossible uh, and unavailable to an independent small business? Uh, that's something that they could never get on their own. They just can't. It's not possible. And so uh, lower cost supplies is a, a natural uh, opportunity there. So instead of them paying $35 for a bundle of boxes, a bundle of 50, uh, with Slice, they get them for 20. Hmm. You mentioned that you have six distribution centers now? We have six uh, different warehouses, yeah. Uh, uh, New York, New Jersey, uh, Fort Lauderdale, Miami, Philadelphia, Connecticut. Why did you decide to go verticalized versus just doing a GPO model, getting a discount from a U.S. Foods or some box supplier? Uh, we wanted to own the the experience, but also um, I think at some point we wanted to, to make sure that um, those economies of scale would be available to the merchants, to the shops long term. Mm. We tried partnering with suppliers. Uh, we created a bunch of referrals. Um, we agreed on price. And then slowly we started hearing from shops that that provider and provider had started to change their prices again. No so way. they were just using Slice as like a lead gen. But ultimately, uh, when when you partner with like U.S. Foods, their, their business is, is food distribution. Uh, their business or there are companies whose business is pizza boxes. Eventually, they're going to try to figure out how to maximize the price there because that is their only source of revenue. For Slice, boxes and supplies isn't our only source of revenue. And so uh, if we can create significant value on that side, it'll reinforce the value we, we bring or lock in value on the demand side, for example. So when you go multi-product, I think you also have some more, more flexibility. You have gross profit dollars from one pool exactly. that you can kind of spread to the other pool and maybe underprice the competition as a way to get in. That's right. Yeah, that makes sense. So you mentioned that you didn't know what venture capital was, by the way. I had no idea. I mean, how did Ben Sun find you and why did you decide to take venture capital money? I, uh, in 2015, February 8th, 2015, um, I went on my Excel sheet where I was tracking sales and I realized that in January of 2015, I had profited $300,000. It was like $280,000, like pure cash in my bank account Whoa. just for the month. And I was like, okay, this is crazy. Like I went and bought a, bought a car. I bought a Bentley cash at Manhattan Motor Cars. Um, I was just like, yeah, this is great. And then I was like, well, this is silly. Uh, I am doing a disservice to the business. This industry is massive. Um, I'm starting to get to a place where I have no idea what I'm doing anymore. So I went on Twitter and I sent a note to three or four different leaders in the food tech space. One of them is Wiley Cirilli. And uh, out of the people that I tagged on, on Twitter, Wiley is the only one who responded. He's like, hey, uh, yeah, like, let me know what's going on. And um, we jumped on a call and he's like, this all sounds cool. When you get to like 200 locations, 300 locations, like, let me know, come, come back. I was like, well, I'm at... 3,000 locations. He's like, come <laughs> to my office tomorrow. Now, I thought Wiley was running a um, single platform. He was one of the early uh, leaders at Seamless. I, I thought he was going to open up his network to me, uh, which he did, uh, but that was my intention. Uh, now, in hindsight, at that time, he was at First Round Capital. And um, I went there. I had no, I have no idea what First Round Capital means. Um, and... He introduced me to Josh Kopelman, spent like two hours with Josh. I left the meeting. Wiley's like, loved you and loves the business. I was, I was like, why does that matter? Who is this guy? I'm, I'm being dead honest. And, um, and so realized that um, in order to get Wiley to, to commit and a few others, um, we needed both some capital, but also I gave them some equity as, as a, basically as a grant. Mm-hmm. And um, Wiley is the one who introduced me to to Ben and at the time Byron, uh, who was here. Mm. Um, I have to check in with Byron. You know Byron? Yeah, of course. I replaced um, him. I tried recruiting Byron to be my co-founder back in the day. There you go. Um, and we met at the Nomad Hotel at the library, 
uh, and we had breakfast there. And um, You're like, who are these fancy VCs that are taking me to the Nomad? No, I didn't. Uh, again, I don't, I don't, I didn't think of them as VCs. Um, and you had a Bentley, so <laughs> Ben, yeah, Ben was uh, both Ben and Byron, uh, but Ben specifically, uh, I just thought was just incredibly smart and asked the right questions, at least um, for that moment in time. He was so helpful in opening up doors for me and um, participated in, in our what was then called a seed round. Ben is one of my favorite people. In the world. And I'm not saying that because I'm at primary or whatnot. He's one of my favorite people in the world, both personally. But I think he is by far one of the best, in my opinion, probably the best um, partners to a founder from both a capital standpoint, but also a strategic mm. and business, uh, you know, uh, standpoint, mm. how to, he just knows when to get really involved and he knows when to just completely zoom out. But in the most, uh, uh, challenging times or the times where we had identity crisis, Ben was the first one in the office, whiteboarding strategy. Here's how we think, here's how we should think about it. What do you think about this? And, you know, just going back and forth. And that was evident in the, in the very early days. And so, um, we were about to do like a, a million dollar round and I extended that to 1.1 million just to get hundred K, uh, allocation for Ben. And then, um, within months when we were going to do a, in a round, I didn't even, we didn't even go in and, and shop it. Hmm. Um, primary led that round, which was a 3 million round at 30 million valuation. And that was in 2016. That was expensive back then. Uh, well, we were already at, as a bootstrap company, we were doing uh, almost five million in revenue. Wow! Uh, and we had about fifty million in GMV. What happened with first round? Um, I went to do a um, a pitch there. A uh, bunch of the first round founders or partners invested, but I panicked in the pitch. I just I couldn't speak. I was like, "What am I doing? Like, why am I here? What, what am who am I talking to?" And uh, and so I, I dropped the ball. But in hindsight, most likely a huge blessing. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember Slice was one of the first board meetings I ever went to working at primary. Mm -hmm. And I think Ben's superpower is, to your point, he knows when he needs to dive deep with the company and he does the work. Yep. Which is, I think, very rare for board members. I'm curious if you've also seen that as well. Uh, absolutely. Um, he does the work. Um I think he is intellectually honest. He and I talk a lot about that. Um, I don't think he's there to like tell me what I want to hear. He's there to tell me the truth, but he does it in a way that is constructive. Mm. Um, and he's always been a partner when it was time to raise our B round, C round. Like he is, I remember coming back in and pitching him and Brad on, uh, on our C round. Um, and they were the ones to, to tell me, hey, um, if I was that investor, I would pass or I would, I would, I would be a buyer, gave construct, constructive feedback. So yeah, uh, across the board. And when I think about this business in particular, he doesn't project mental models from all these other businesses under your business. He tends to do a lot of research and talks to experts. And I think that's so important because it's really dangerous when investors try to give you a point of view from a different company that actually has nothing to do with what your customer truly wants or your market actually needs. I think that's probably one of the most dangerous uh, aspects of, uh, or traps for a potential VC. Now that I've gotten to know, you know, so many VCs and uh, have been uh, welcomed into the industry in general. Um, yeah. Analogous thinking without context is, uh, can be a huge trap. Um, I think what else, what else I like about Ben, since we're on the topic, is, you know, he he also thinks about businesses like companies like Slice as businesses. I don't think he ever thought about it as a startup. Hmm. Um, now, a startup is just a business committed to growth, but I don't think he ever thought about it as like this is a pure software company, so let's stay within the software rules. I don't think he thinks about it that way. He's like, look, um, we had a recent conversation about supplies. He's like, okay, your gross margin on the supplies business is 20%. Mm -hmm. But your gross profit um, for that business is 8x what you're making on the software. 
So who gives it? Who cares? If you're making, you know, I'll, I'll use generic numbers, illustrative numbers. If you're making $500 a month in profit from supplies, but you're making $100 a month in profit from software, why do I care that your software margins are six? Like you're, you're, you're now netting out $700 a month per, per account. Um, why wouldn't we do that? Turns out it helps your cash flow. It's just a, a great <laughs> business decision. Now, mm -hmm. I understand multiples and all that stuff, and we have to be thoughtful, but I think too many people shy away from doing what's necessary for the customer because they want to fit some profile of who other people um, have predefined. Is that why you said once upon a time that most founders having a board is an accident? Share more context. So I think I had read a quote you talking about most founders having a board is a mistake. Yeah. Um, I think it's a mistake for founders to, um, um, have conversations with board members and just replicate their feedback into the business. They're basically like your job isn't to just, um, do what board members tell you to do. That's a data point and you should probably flush out those ideas. But I think it's a huge mistake to just, um, um, solve for the business model of the of the board member. Um, at the top of everybody's priority should be the business, the customer, and you have to do what's best for that, N not what's best for the VC and then reverse engineer that into the company. So th that I think is a huge mistake that I see uh, a lot of people make it. I've made it from time to time. I mean, I've seen more companies get whiplashed by something said in the boardroom that the VC doesn't actually know for a fact, then positive results oftentimes there. Yeah, it's, I call these traps. Um, but I used to think when I was younger, I used to think, um, you know, oh, um, maybe this, this was a huge mistake. But you know what? It was that board member's idea. So, you know, it is what it is. Until I learned that every decision made is the founder or CEO owns the decision. Mm. And I've seen cases where if a board member uh, pushes an idea and I went and ran with it and executed that idea and it failed, that same board member has come back to me and said, what the hell were we doing? It's um, amazing. And they blame you, not themselves. And <laughs> to be quite honest, uh, the, the CEO deserves the blame. Mm-hmm. Well, to wrap, because I got to let you go, I like to ask everybody one question. If you were mayor of New York City, what's one change you would make? It's a great question. I uh, appreciate the heads up on this in advance. And I was thinking about a million different things like, you know, uh, give a free slice to every, every resident. <laughs> but that's not what it is. I would, um, in all seriousness, um, um, enforce the law. And I don't mean that in like a forceful way, but uphold the law and prosecute crime. Uh, if you New don't York. do that, I mean, or just bring back Bloomberg as the mayor. Mm -hmm. I would, I would give my position to, to Bloomberg. That's what I would do. Amazing. Thank you very yeah. much, Lear. You got it. Thanks.